football in Baghdad. Saddam Hussein towers over Iraqis' lives at every turn. But if people here are frightened of war or their leader, they don't show it. There's a goal just passed through the, the goalkeeper, and you heard just the people here laughing, and uh, we, we're having a normal life. Normal? Perhaps not. But Iraqis are battle-hardened from years of conflict. Most people in this crowd have never known peace and prosperity. They've grown up in the iron grip of Saddam Hussein, and for the past decade their country's been squeezed by economic sanctions. Life isn't about to get better anytime soon. While the outside world prepares for another war, as far as most Iraqis are concerned, the last one never ended. Bustling Baghdad exudes energy, the energy of a young country. Two thirds of Iraqis are under 25. They've only ever known Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And there's no doubting who's in charge. The novel for uh, this semester is going to be Sons and Lovers to D.H. Lawrence. Tonight, we'll hear from Iraq's future elite. Not from the politicians and generals who run the place now, but from the young men and women who'll be the country's teachers, doctors, lawyers and diplomats for decades to come, whatever happens to Saddam. How do they view the threat of war? We might die here. Nobody knows. You might live today, you get bombed tomorrow, you're dead. So it's pretty hard and we're pretty paralysed here. You don't know what to do, you don't know what to think. Baghdad University is full of a generation who've grown up under siege to believe that it's Iraq against the rest of the world. My worst fear is to get invaded and occupied by another uh, people, by another <laughs> government. This is the worst thing, that to lose your nationality, lose your freedom. If Bush wants to bomb us, they, he will bomb us. No, nothing's going to prevent him from doing that. So, but in the same time, we have to live our normal lives. I mean, uh, we can't just stay in our houses, uh, hiding behind the, behind the doors, waiting uh, for the bombs or to, for the alarm to break out. Far from staying in their houses, Iraqis are out on the street, selling or trying to sell what they can. A television goes for a couple of hundred dollars. It's cash to buy food to get some supplies in case of war. What people can buy from their own pockets is boosted by a monthly ration of staples, part of the Oil for Food program, which allows the Iraqi government to sell a limited amount of oil and then import food and other basics under strict UN supervision. It's like you have a small coupon and the coupon will title every single person in the country to get a supply of rice, sugar, wheat, wheat flour and uh, let's say like some beans, milk, things that can be stored. With war looming, the Iraqi government is giving people an advance on their rations so they can build up a stake at home. It's practical help, which also strengthens Saddam's control over people's lives. I mean, the government did a really great job in handling the situation. The ration is a really, let's say, it's a really good factor. It's like it's not allowing a lot of people to starve, especially in Baghdad. But this system is working unless it's supplemented from by import. If we can't import for the next two months, we'll, we'll have people starving here all over. The economic sanctions against Iraq were meant to break Saddam Hussein's hold on power. Twelve years later, they've done nothing of the sort and are viewed by Iraqis as cruel at worst, idiotic at best. I mean, we couldn't get pencils for, for a few years because it had carbon. We could use carbon in nuclear warfare. Come on, kids over here didn't even write on pencil. So does the sanctions policy make any sense from your Not at all. 
Uday Jafar Sadiq is 23 years old. He was born in Iraq and went to high school in the United States. He's seen what the West has to offer, but sees his future firmly in Iraq. I don't know, I love the life here for some reason or another. It's like, I mean, kids here could stay outside till 2. I, I could stay till 2 and no one's going to say, 2 in the morning, and no one's going to say, where were you or what happened? We, we, we're worried. Life is safe here, and this is what I like about here. He's finishing his language degree in Baghdad and hopes to follow in his father's footsteps. Hopefully, hopefully I get accepted to work at the foreign ministry. If I get that, that'd be okay, and have a, few, have a little business on the side. Iraq's modern history has been shaped by one thing, oil. But recent events are a tale of lost opportunities. The oil is a curse, for my, in my opinion, it is a curse than it is a blessing. I'm not getting anything out of the oil. I mean, we're sitting on mounds of gold, we can't even use it. We can't use it to buy anything. Why have it then? Iraqis haven't been getting much from their oil for over a decade. Before Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990, they enjoyed a standard of living the envy of men. Now the argument goes here, America and Britain want control of the country's vast reserves. The hunt for chemical and biological weapons is just a cover. The inspectors have been going all around uh, Iraq for, for how many years now? For more than 10 years? And they didn't find anything. They were, so here we got two possibilities. Even they are not good enough and they can't do their job correctly, so they didn't find them yet, or they, we really don't have them. And that's the real reason. And on top of this charge is a deeper feeling among Iraqis that the world is divided into two different groups. The powerful West, which can have what it likes, and the rest, who can do what they're told. I'm not saying we should. All I'm saying is, why can't we? Why is it that Iraqis can't have this, but Israel can have that, and the states can have that? And well, what is it? It's just, it's just power and control problems. They don't want so, such people to have power. We don't, they don't want us to have power at all. Over all of this hovers the figure of Saddam Hussein, projecting an image of pure power. Power as strength, a symbol of defiance. Saddam Hussein and oil. That's it. So what of Washington's other stated aim, saving Iraqis from a ruthless dictator? <laughs> Young Iraqis who live in the constant shadow of war say targeting Saddam has more to do with American pride than human rights. Just because Saddam Hussein stood against them and said, no, I'm not going to be one of what, what you want me to be. I'm going to be what I am. Washington has spent more than a decade trying to knock Saddam over, telling people here they're being ruled by a tyrant. Do they believe it? Asking the question is the old witch's test. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Absolutely not a dictator. He, he gave us and giving us a lot of opportunities to live our simple life. He uh, made uh, our education free without any charges. He built a lot of uh, facilities, a lot of uh, things that he de developed. So we don't think that he's a dictator at all. Remember, this is a man who won not 99% of the popular vote last time he and he alone stood for office, but 100%, every vote. If someone of the Iraqi citizens doesn't like the president or he doesn't like the attitude of our government, he will say it. Nothing is going to stop him. I mean, our president is one person and the people are 25 million. So uh, what do you think that one person can do to 25 million? He can't do anything. Are Iraqis really free to speak out against Saddam Hussein? True or false? True and false. I mean, it depends. I mean, uh, you would... Like, uh, I can't answer that. I mean, this is like, well, this is, this is really a serious question, you know. Iraqis do live by different rules, but equally, they feel the world knows nothing of their true plight. 
Well, the image is that we're just a bunch of savages. We don't know anything is j except to say jihad, jihad, jihad. That's the only thing that, that we know how to do. And hold AK-47s and ride my camel from one part of the town to the other. That's the only image that they have. The prevailing mood here is of impending conflict. Yet it's oddly normal at the same time, as though this was business as usual. The day works nights as a computer repairman. I'm angry at a lot of governments. I'm not angry at any people, that's one thing for sure. But there is a clear sense that games are being played, games that could cost people's lives. Of course it's a political game, and that's just it. That's, that's my opinion, at least. I don't know. But basically what it is, it's just profit. Blood for oil. Everything in Iraq is political. The pre-match warm-up to this football game is pure propaganda. We'll dig your grave in Baghdad if you can. I'm just going to translate you. We're going to dig your grave here in Baghdad, George Bush. So don't came here. It's not that another war is just another game to Iraqis. Far from it. They know the price. Actually, you have to know that there is no father or mother are, gonna, are sleeping at night because they just keep on thinking about the future of their children. And it's normal because no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. For decades, the big powers have tried to rig the game here, and Iraqis have paid the penalty. So they're deeply suspicious of the latest American plans to install their own man in Baghdad.